So um, all perspectives are offered only for stakeholder self-education. Guthie Jackson Charitable Foundation does not perform clinical trials, nor does it endorse any particular clinic trial design or drug. All content is solely that of respective presenters or company representatives. Breakout sessions will be posted on the foundation website for further, for, I'm sorry, for future viewing slash audio. Um, we hope that these resources are informative and helpful to all NMO stakeholders. Does anybody else watch, what do you know? If you're here, what do you know? It's like, I feel like I'm doing the five disclaimers for that show. <laughs> All right, so um, my name is Janet Dean, and I am a pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, I work at Kennedy Krieger Institute in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, um, at the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury. So I take care of kids from birth all the way up to the last day of their 21st year um, that have a spinal cord injury. And um, NMO is a way you get a spinal cord injury. And the consequences that you deal with when you've had a spinal cord lesion are consequences of a spinal cord injury, okay? So there's a lot of similarities. There are some differences. Um, so uh, um, most of the symptoms, like I said, bowel dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, pain, paralysis, weakness are generally the result of your spinal cord lesions. So what I always tell my patients is if you go to a specialist or if you have to go to the emergency room or something, don't tell them you have NMO. <laughs> tell them you have, if it's related to your spinal cord injury, and that's anything except for the vision. You know, tell them that you have uh, um, a spinal cord injury caused by neuromyelitis optica. People are much more likely, spinal cord injury is rare, but not near as rare as NMO. So I, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, so when you have a bowel and bladder dysfunction, um, it is, your bowel and bladder is controlled by the very bottom of your spinal cord. So if there's any problems with the signal getting through between your brain and the very bottom of your spinal cord, you're gonna have bowel and bladder issues and potentially sexual dysfunction. How severe or how complete, it all just depends on, on your lesion. So um, I'm, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit now is just sort of the basics of getting a good evaluation and some basic treatment. And then I have that handout in the back that's got a lot more detail. So I don't have a magic cure, but what my hope is to help manage symptoms so that you don't have bowel or bladder accidents. Um, and uh, so that's where I'm working from. So bladder dysfunction, symptoms with NMO can range from urgency and frequency all the way up to not being able to empty your bowel and bladder at all and needing to use like a catheter to help empty your bladder. Um, in order to find out how to best manage your bladder, you really need to see a specialist, um, and that would be a urologist. Um, and there are actually neurourologists, if you can find one. Um, in big uh, you know, medical centers, you might be more likely to find a neurourologist. If not, you would like to find a, neuro a urologist that works with spinal cord injury um, because they're going to probably be better able to help you. So one of the things that you really need is a... Um, Okay, one of the things you really need to have done is a study called Eurodynamics, that it's in the handout. And that will help give information on how your bladder is working. There's a couple of different ways when you've had uh, NMO, is your bladder could be flaccid, so it just fills up like a big balloon and you can't empty it, or it can be spastic, so it's just doing this and wants to empty all the time and you're running to the bathroom. You have to know which it is to be able to figure out how to best manage that. Um, bowel management, also you need to be um, working with specialists. Urologists sometimes do a little bit of that. GI doctors don't usually have much training in neurogenic bowel that's caused by spinal lesions or spinal cord injury. So usually um, your neurologist may know some, but a lot of times they may refer you for, to a physiatrist or a rehabilitation specialist that actually works with patients with spinal cord injury. And if you have a lot of spinal cord symptoms, it, it may be something that you might want to think about um, is, is to work also with a physiatrist because they can help with managing some of the symptoms also. So for bowel management, um, 
a few things that you may need to have done is a, a rectal exam. So have somebody check to make sure you have sensation at the rectal sphincter. And then also have somebody actually use a finger and have you try and squeeze a finger to know whether the sphincter works. And I know that sounds awful, but it's really important because what I find if people have had problems is that sometimes they have sensation, but they don't have any control of their rectal sphincter and they don't know it. Um, so, and your rectal sphincter, depending on where your injury is, can be either flaccid and um, you ha can have trouble holding stool in, or it can be really tight and spastic, so you have trouble going to the bathroom. And it's important to know which that is um, to figure out what the right treatment is. Um, sexual dysfunction uh, also uh, can be evaluated by specialists. Um, for men, specifically, a urologist um, and a urologist that specializes in spinal cord injury can help with that. Um, for women, um, some of the urologists actually um, do sexual dysfunction in women. Oftentimes, again, it's the rehab specialist that can work with you with sexual dysfunction. Um, and uh, sexual dysfunction, you know, for men can involve not having, being able to have an erection, not being able to ejaculate, not having sensation, um, and uh, um, not being able to have an orgasm. Reproduction can be, with men, can be affected, um, but for the most part, with help of the reproductive endocrinologist, men that have spinal cord injury or NMO from spinal cord lesion can have children. For women, um, sexual dysfunction also you know, goes the range from just not having sensation or having numbness. You can have decreased lubrication, um, difficulty having an orgasm. Um, and for women, fertility is generally not affected by spinal cord injury. Um, so uh, that's something I always warn my young adults about. <laughs> Um, so those are things that you can see with um, spinal cord dysfunction. So now, in my experience, constipation is the root of all evils. Not necessarily for sexual dysfunction, but for bowel and bladder management, constipation is the root of all evils. Because if you're very constipated, then there's, you can be full of stool, and I see it on x-ray all the time, and there's no room for your bladder. So your bladder can't fill up. And so you will have frequency and urgency, and it can actually block off your urethra from emptying. So it seems to me that most of the time when I talk to people, they're having difficulty with constipation, um, and that's the first thing. If you're having bowel and bladder issues, that's the first thing you want to take care of, is get the constipation taken care of. Um, and then once the constipation is taken care of, then we can work on the bladder issues. Um, but I find that you need to take care of that and some and one way to find out if you're constipated and you know I work with kids and you know parents always say oh my god they they have these huge bowel movements and I still say yeah yeah but I bet you they're not quite emptying and you can do an x-ray and just see just you can see it up to the rib cage um, so that's not an uncommon occurrence in patients that have difficulty um, having a bowel movement because they just don't empty all the way so things that you can do, and I have a lot of resources in there and talk about medications, but you know, first of all, you want to keep your stool soft. And that can be by diet or medication. Fiber is great. You want to keep stool moving through. And some people with spinal cord injury have decreased motility of their, their um, GI tract. And so Senna is one medication that you can use to kind of help things moving through. And then if you are not able to empty your bowel and um, you're having accidents, if you ha have a spastic rectal sphincter, you, would you could use a suppository to retrain your body to go at the same time every day um, and not have accidents. Um, if your sphincter is very, very flaccid and you leak stool a lot, sometimes you just have to remove it manually, um, and that's what um, would be treatment for that. Um, and if you're really, really constipated, what I use is, um, what we use is basically a colonoscopy clean out if any of you have had that. And you know, you can, you can take Miralax um, you know, for a long time and if you, don't have any, if you don't have trouble controlling your stool so much, if you take Miralax for quite a while, you, you can get things softened up and moved around. Um, but 
Um, if you want to get it over and done with, you just do the colonoscopy cleanup kind of thing, or high doses of Miralax, and I can give people information on that. But you need to take care of that first. Um, as far as bladder um, uh, treatments go, you know, if you have a spastic bladder, then you can, there's many, many, many medications that you can use to help relax your bladder so that you're not running to the bathroom so frequently. Um, the issue with sometimes with doing that though is if you also have trouble with your um, the sphincter of your bladder you will um, you may have trouble going to the bathroom if your bladder is too relaxed so that's something that you need to keep in mind um, if your bladder is very flaccid and just blows up you know just fills up fills up fills up it will overflow um, and um, you can leak urine it's called overflow incontinence um, and so having understanding if that's what you have will um, help the urologist decide whether you need to be on an intermittent cath program sometimes. And intermittent catheterization, if you have a lot of trouble with leaking or if you um, just can't initiate a stream of urine or you can't empty your bladder and you're having frequent urinary tract infections, um, it, it may be that you would want to go on a catheter, catheterization program to manage those symptoms. So it, 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 it just depends on what your individual symptoms are. Um, with sexual dysfunction, um, there are uh, treatments including medications um, for uh, women and men. Um, and so the physiatrist or the urologist can help with that kind of uh, thing. And I, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, so I'm, you know, and I have adult practitioners that work with me and when my kids come in and say I need Viagra I'm like la, 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 la. <laughs> okay time to go to the adult doctors <laughs> but no seriously that does help with uh, men with spinal cord injury can be helpful those types of medications um, and there are also other injectable medications and various things that you can um, look for for women um, you know it's mostly difficulty with lack of sensation and lack of lubrication which is easily overcome with lubricants um, and, and the thing about sexual dysfunction is that sex usually can't be as spontaneous if you're having problems. You, you have to think about it. And there's primary sexual dysfunction, then there's secondary sexual dysfunction. And, you know, for people with NMO, fatigue, bowel and bladder issues, if you're afraid of having an accident or things like that can all play into difficulty with um, sexual relationships. The other group of professionals that can help with that are there are rehabilitation psychologists and there are ones that specialize in spinal cord injury and they are often very good at helping sort of with couples counseling if you're having issues with that um, and helping to, to look about uh, other ways to be intimate um, and you know how to establish communication and you know that kind of stuff. So that's another group of professionals that often can can assist with sort of you know the psychological component of that. All right. So that's kind of my overview. Is there questions that specific questions that people may have that I can help with? And as I think I said, I will I can take individual questions that you know afterwards if you don't. And with the numbness being painful? No, just lack of sensation. Just lack of sensation. Um, I think that they use some of like, even like the Viagras with women that might be able to help with just increasing blood flow to that area, which may um, give more sensation. No, that it, they use sort of the same the same medication. It's the same medication. Okay. Um, so, I, I have heard that that's been used in women to help just increase the blood flow in that area. Um, if if you're having pain, the same medications, and some women can have pain in that area, and men too. Um, that uh, you know, the gabapentins or um, Neurontin or Lyrica are things that can be um, tried to relieve pain. Um, you know what the if there's you know issues with lack of sensation in one area they they talk about body mapping that you know people may have other areas that gain more sensitivity um, and are more responsive and that's kind of the 
the sort of psychological part of that or the communication and then sort of the experimenting part of trying to figure out what other parts in your body may be more responsive and, you know, things like, things like that. Yes. Frequency. Or frequency or pain. Yes. And, um, but I also still deal with regular bleeding. I have given birth to five children, uh -huh. four of which were natural, one safe. So yeah. I have a new family doctor who is clueless about everything. He's right. A, a new doctor even at that. And so the first, he was just like, I don't know, I mean, maybe see a urologist. But I don't, I don't necessarily want to fill my body up with unnecessary medication mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. or something that maybe there's a better way to deal with besides people, right. you know, right. like, which I already knew. So, <laughs> so overactive bladder is common in women as they age and women okay. that have had babies, yeah. and it also can be common with NMO. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes the urologist will just, ex or urologist or your, maybe your family doctor can, can experiment with one of the medications that you can use for overactive bladder. Um, you know, the one that we usually use most often is Ditropan, which is the old one. Um, it comes as an extended release form. It comes as a short-acting form. Um, it's the cheaper ones, you know, because it's old. Um, and it's been used a lot. So you, and there's a million of these medications. It's talk about big pharma. Yeah. <laughs> the overactive bladder is big pharma. Um, and so you can trial some of those to see... Um, if you can relax your bladder, if your bladder is a little bit spastic. And again, if you're not having huge problems, going through a whole urodynamics testing is, is probably overkill. Uh -huh. um, so you can just experiment with those medications um, if your family doctor or, or urologist would help you and, and just trial and you trial to see. But make sure that they understand that you do have NMO and if you've had spinal cord lesions, kind of where they are, where they were. Um, so that you, you can do that. Yes? Okay, on, on that same vein, I've been taking oxygen time and five milligrams four times a day uh -huh. for almost the past five years. Uh -huh. I was diagnosed with MO. But now I'm finding that the last eight, eight to ten months, the efficacy, I think, is waning. And I'm getting up now twice in the middle of the night to pee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there are different formulations, and you're still on. You can go up to 30 milligrams oh, okay. of the Ditropan. Um, and so what you might experiment with doing is trying to take 10 at night, oh, okay. and and see if and and you might even still, or you could even see if you might get away with taking one in the morning, one late in the afternoon, and two at night. Um, or add another one in. So it's still, it's still a, you know, you're still on a relatively low dose. I mean, yeah. So, and then there are the long-acting formulations of, uh, of um, Ditropan, but for some people it doesn't work as well. Um, the, you know, the, it it kind of goes up on a dose and it stays here, and then it goes down, and the, the short-acting one goes, up higher, up higher, down lower, and sometimes it just depends. Um, and then if that's not working, you know, there are, like I said, there are a whole bunch of that you could experiment with. Yep, yep. But I would say try maybe increasing your dose. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that may, because it is hard to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, might, be, that might be worth uh, giving a try. On, on what medicine are you on? Bacitri Bactrim? Yeah. 
So most often these are medications called anticholinergics and they, um, she probably knows what the side effects are. They can cause dry mouth, they can cause difficulty with the sun, they can, you can get sunburned easier. Um, those are the, the dry mouth is the biggest side effect that people complain about and, and constipation because it dries, it dries you up. So, so it can also add to constipation issues. Uh, medication isn't working. Uh -huh. As so, the medication is a, you're on a cath program, or she is now. and and the medications don't seem to work to allow you to be dry between catheterizations. Um, <clears throat> you know, most of the most of the other procedures are m most other things that you could do would require surgery, um, and so it's trying to adjust the medicine trying to adjust your cath program um, as best as you can. And, and I don't know if you've had urodynamics done. Okay, because that will, that will kind of help. And if you're having, if you were doing well and are now having symptoms, it, sometimes that's when they think about doing another urodynamic study um, to see uh, if it's been a while. Um, but again, trialing different medications. If you're using an anticholinergic, um, and that's ditropan, or I can't even remember all the other ones, oxybutynin. So if you're, if you're um, having difficulty with one, you could try another and see if that gives more relaxation. And make sure you're also, ma you're, you've maxed out the dose, you know, of the medicine that you're on, unless you're having bad side effects from it. Yes. I, I don't. They don't pay money, I know. So. No, yeah, and I, I don't really know too much about that. We do use, like, cranberry for yeah. prevention of urinary tract infection. The research doesn't support that, but people tell me that it does work. Um, and there's another, uh, D-mannose is another, um, and I think D-mannose is kind of a sugar. So cranberry juice uh, makes the bladder acidic and bacteria doesn't like acid, and I think d mannose is like a sugar that makes your beard sweet, but it's not like a sugar you'll get overweight with or anything. So that's another thing that people try um, for uh, trying to prevent or minimize urinary tract infections. Um, and urinary tract infections generally come because you're not emptying your bladder all the way and urine is staying in there. Um, and so um, that, that can become problematic because certainly we don't want to see you with kidney damage. Um. Anything else? Yes. So I have um, like stress incontinence. Mm -hmm. And then I have retention pills. What can I do? Oh, I mean, boy. I, I go and then I can't get my urine again. Uh -huh. I go and I don't want to do Uh huh. So, um, you know, I think stress incontinence can be just, I have stress incontinence and I don't have NMO, so that might be, you know, sort of unrelated to the NMO part, but it may be because, yeah, because you have a sphincter that's not very tight, um, and, and it's, you know, what's called bladder sphincter dyssynergia, so sometimes the bladder contracts and the sphincter doesn't relax like it's supposed to. So, um, you know, if you're if you're not so you're yeah. so you, it's just difficult it's difficult so pr probably pretty much um, I mean sometimes we yeah that that becomes the issue um, and sometimes uh, you you could do a trial of um, anticholinergic medications to relax your bladder and then do a cath program and see if you could, if you do a cath program, you know, every three or four hours that you might be able to stay dry in between. Um, yeah. it's, it's a tough problem. It's a tough problem. And there's, there's not really any medications that sort of tighten the sphincter or, yeah. 
Yeah. And do, do you try, um, do you have difficulty like initiating a stream of urine or difficulty um, yeah, emptying? Okay. You do that already. Okay. And you still just have difficulty with. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And um, and so even right after you empty your bladder, you'll have problems with stress. Yes. Hmm. And are you? What size catheter are you using? Okay. Because I was going to say, sometimes what happens is that you're not emptying your bladder all the way with your catheter. I've seen that. If people are using really small catheters, it takes a long time to drain. So that was a thought I had. Um, when you said eight, I was like, ah, that takes forever. <laughs> so, yeah. And you've had urodynamic studies done? Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. And I, I, uh, right, 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 right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even if you cath right before, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So there is a procedure that, um, they can put a stoma in your belly button, so it's called a metrophenoff. So they can actually use your appendix and um, go between uh, your belly button and your bladder. And it's patent, so you cath through it and it doesn't leak. And then they do, they will sew your urethra closed. That might be something, well, but, but not, it's not as extreme as a sling. And then you would probably not have as much difficulty leaking. Um, and so that's a procedure. And that's really not a, it's not a terrible procedure because they do, they can use a little appendix or a little bowel. And so it's not, not horrible. Um, and, and do you know, is your bladder just small? Because sometimes if you're, you know, and, and it, it, is your bladder being relaxed enough? Um, to hold enough urine. Sounds like it does. Okay. So the urodynamics, they can tell you, like, you know, how, how much capacity your bladder has. Yeah, so you could, you could see about that, and that would make a difference to how much medications that you, you take. But, but, the, but, you know, with a metrophenoff, you probably would get rid of the issues of leaking. Um, so you could, and that's a procedure that's done more frequently in kids, um, and it, it's usually used in people that can't use their hands um, to catheterize or, or, or have difficulty, you know, um, uh, having to remove their clothes. And, and it's done more in pediatrics than in the adult world. Um, so you might have trouble finding somebody in the adult world that, that does that procedure, but it might be worth kind of talking about and investigating. So if they don't have to augment your bladder or make your bladder bigger, it, it generally would be fairly reversible. But, you know, I tell my kids that, you know, they can't cath themselves like girls that, you know, can't get undressed to do that. And it's like, you know, if there was a cure for spinal cord injury, putting a catheter in your belly button wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, <laughs> you know. So it's always a balance of trying to cope with all the issues. Mm -hmm. And I see in this patient, she has a bit of one of the uh, screening features of fecal canal. She was having trouble working with her bladder control, and she was getting Botox injections. That's a very good point, too. But unfortunately, she said it doesn't last that long. It's only good for maybe three or four months huh. or okay. Wow. Would you recommend that, or, or is, okay. that, would that so, the procedure to get Botox? So Botox is a very... Um, it's a very good procedure, but it's only used basically on people that have spastic bladders, you know, the overactive bladder, because you want to relax it. Um, and that would be something that, um, that flew into my mind and flew back out 
<laughs> I'm glad you brought it up, um, is that might be something if you do have a spastic bladder, um, they can do Botox injections that help to relax it. Um, it's supposed to last about six months. Um, well, yes, you, you may or may not. Um, so that's the problem. You have to be willing to self-cath um, because the way Botox works is that it, it wears off. So there might be a period where you would have to self-cath and then maybe you wouldn't um, if, it, you know, if it was able to relax your bladder. It won't do anything for the stress incontinence other than help you hold more urine if your, your, your bladder is spastic and if it has a small capacity. So, um, so yes, uh, but it, it is a bit of a procedure. You have to go under anesthesia. They use a cystoscope, but, but I've had a lot of people, you know, folks have good success with that. Well, they gave me the five signal, so if anybody, uh, if you, I've answered all the questions I can, or you want to talk to me individually, or I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>